Let's go over a couple things here. Um, covered a lot this morning, probably created more questions than answers. But that, that was designed to, to cause you to start to seek God in deeper manners. So much available information out there in different areas. And the Lord's wanting us to be more, more aware of what's going on, but then also to look to the Spirit to help us to navigate through and give us wisdom. Um, one of the things that I do, and I, I have these things right here. I want to go over this. Looking for it. There we go. Talked about this a little bit this morning, Galatians chapter 3. And then um, okay, we can start here in Colossians chapter 1, verse 28. I want to show you something here. He, he said, um, that Paul says we preach him and proclaim in warning. So there's a warning too. The Paul talks about these different words. So it's not just one thing. There's preaching, proclaiming, and then there's warning, warning people and admonishing people. And and essentially they're all included in on instructing. But there's times where, like what I had to do this morning, the Lord had me say things that kind of trigger you to start think, a thinking process. And this is what I found. Um, when I was at the airline, um, I, was a, I was a flight attendant for 30 years. And, um, but I was a lead flight attendant, so I was up front in the front part. And then I was the one that was over the fl other flight attendants. But then I answered to the captain and I kind of coordinated between the cockpit and the cabin. And so I learned a lot in 30 years. I learned a lot about that airplane. And I learned a lot about pilots. And th there was good things about pilots and bad things about pilots, just like there's good things about everything and everybody. But I always, I always think, um, I mean, I'm just telling you, I will learn something from everybody, you know, no, no matter who it is. I mean, I learn from the devil every day. I mean, it's kind of weird, but I mean, he flaps his jaw and he always overplays his hand. And, it, and I, it, I learn from that. Satan always overplays his hand, always gives you, does more because he's, he's rejected. So he's, he's in rejection. He's a narcissist too as well, but he's rejected. So he's going to do things out of rejection. And the worst thing you can do is ignore him. If you ignore a narcissist or, or an evil spirit is the worst thing you can do to them. Because their whole idea is to get attention and, and to try to control. So that's narcissistic and that's rejection. Okay. Any questions? Okay. We're, we can dismiss. No. All right. So um, the idea here is, is that uh, what I learned about authority as far as um, in churches with working with pastors, I was never a head pastor. I was an assistant pastor and Kathy was too, is that... Um, there's this, this thing about letting, letting someone who's in authority think that they thought it. <laughs> because if you appear, like, like in church, if you appear to be more spiritual or you heard something from God and the pastor didn't hear it or the apostle, that kind of makes them feel bad. But see, the way it's set up is false so that the whole body should be hearing from God and we should have checks and balances. But see, it's not set up that way. So if someone wants to be in control and they're not the one calling the shots, if someone else has a better idea, they're going to shoot that down. And then a year later, they're going to do it. And you're like, well, that's what I just told you. And that would happen all the time. So what I learned is, is that um, I learned this is that so that you don't appear that you're doing a better job, you got to make it something that is their idea by leading them in the right directions and let them come to the conclusion. 
And so a lot of times Paul does that. He talks like a lawyer would. He, he says things and then he, he has a way of talking to people. It sounds like he's repetitive at times, but it was a style. Uh, Pharisees were actually like lawyers as well. So they argued with you about religion. So you couldn't really, you couldn't win a conversation, you couldn't win an argument with Paul as Saul because he had all the information and he, he would argue. And so these Pharisees were always arguing with Jesus and all the people would never do what Jesus was doing because they couldn't win against someone like that. But he would always win. But sometimes he had to say, well, you know, you answer this question and then I'll answer your question. And he would trap them to shut them down. And um, so I, I noticed that there are times where in order to function, I would have to let other people get the credit in order to function in, or you're, you're really pulling at the fabric and it would unravel. And then all of a sudden you're causing division and splitting a church when all you were doing is like, hey, you might want to consider this, you know, and I wouldn't do that if I were you, you know, and it's, it's like, a, so the way the word of God is at times, the way that God presents things to us and the way that Paul presents it is sometimes um, there's different ways of getting the truth across. And sometimes it's correction, but see, sometimes correction doesn't always go over well. Because my whole, my whole idea is like, if I, if I have to say something corrective, I don't want to lose the person. You know, the whole idea is not to win a conversation or win an argument. You know, you can, you know, people would, would argue about theology, but then they really need to get saved. And in some cases, people weren't even saved. So if you win the argument about truth, like a, as far as like a, a, a doctrine or whatever, then the person still goes to hell. I mean, really, have you won anything? You know, if you won the argument, but you haven't won them over, you know, for salvation, you got to remember that. And that's the whole idea about Paul and how you teach, preach, admonish, and sometimes warn. Sometimes just telling like what this is the conversation I had with you this morning, that sometimes is more effective because then it starts to generate questions in your, in your heart towards God and toward what you're reading and maybe the way you look at things and, and how life is. Um, there's a lot of things that I was told that if I, if I had not been told them, I would never have got there on my own. <laughs> and that's what happened when I went into the operation. I literally had been you know, to all the, the best schools I thought were available and had all these de the d degrees and everything. But I was shocked when I was over on the other side on just conversations where Jesus was quoting scripture. Some scripture I didn't even believe was in the Bible. And I was a theologian. I mean, I thought I had read everything. He gave me chapter and verse. I literally, because I was bedridden when I got out of the operation. I couldn't really do anything for three weeks after the operation. So I just would look up. Um, I had someone come and record my conversations and I, I, cause I, I could still recall things. And I knew the Lord said, be sure to do that because they will slip from you. A lot of it has slipped from me that, that, so I, I know what I, what I could write. I wrote in, in the books, but there are certain things that have, you know, that take a while to come back or they never come back. So I did that, but there were scripture verses that I had, I had mentioned that I wanted to look up that I didn't know were in there. And Jesus was very, very adamant about certain things. So I, when I looked them up, they were in there. But when he told me about these scriptures, because he would explain everything to me, I was shocked at how that's there, but we, we don't get it. And, and it didn't matter how many hours I'd been to Bible school and studied and things like that. Um, so sometimes uh, Jesus, like one, one time he told, you know, when he told me the, the first thing he said to me when I was, was outside of my body in the operating room was he said that you will be held accountable for every idle word that comes out of your mouth. I didn't even know that was in the Bible. 
Because they, even though, you know, we were taught that words are important, that they never mentioned that scripture at all. Because that was like a negative connotation. Um, but I, I, when I was with Jesus, I mean, everything counts. Like everything you do or don't do counts. It really does. And it's, it's supposed to be a positive thing. But some people just need warned that, listen, you know, and so Jesus said this to me. And when he said it to me, he said, you know, I meant that when I said that, because he, he said who he said it to. And, and in Matthew 12, 36, I didn't know it was in the Bible. You know, I didn't even know that chapter 12 had 36 verses, you know. Well, it shocked me because when he told it to me, he, he said it, and then he walked up to me, right, got right in my face, and he goes, you know, I meant that. And I got so guilty, and, you know, this, this of course, won't get you on TV if you start talking about feeling guilty, and, you know, because some circles of, of people, they, they, they don't even believe that. Like, I saw Jesus tear up and cry. Oh, he wouldn't cry. He, nobody cries in heaven, you know. And I go, well, he did, because people were sitting on the fence, and he said, I didn't hang on a cross for people to be on the fence. And he started tearing up. And I, that just, these things go over well. So he was actually really stern with me. I wouldn't say he was angry, but I would say he was not pleased because I flapped my jaw all the time. And so after that, it got to where I don't hardly talk at all unless I'm supposed to. And like with Kathy and I, we can go a whole week in our house and just say just the most needed things sometimes because we're studying or praying. And we'd, then we go and we'll talk a little bit. But like, like when I'm out on the road like this, we hardly talk because I got to keep my spirit hooked up with my tongue. And she understands that. I got to come down here and, and, and say what the Lord's saying to me. And then I got a, you know, another next hour, I'm doing it again and then again. And then, you know, we're getting on a plane and flying. So then I'm, I'm having to have that mentality. That's a whole nother world. So there's times where Jesus, you know, and we'll have Paul or one of us warn people instead of like teaching or whatever. I mean, I taught this morning, but what I'm saying is, is sometimes the spirit will say things to you to jar you. And that's part of it. And I was shocked when Jesus went through all the scriptures about the tongue and being the rudder and how we had become ineffective on moving mountains with our words because we didn't count the tongue as sacred and the words that we speak as sacred and like our offerings. We, when we give, it, it should be literally, we were giving a part of ourselves. So it's sacred. So that's why I warn people I mean, I've had people steal from me, steal from the offerings, steal this, steal that. And it's, it's I mean, Ananias and Sapphira died. There, you don't touch certain things. You don't, you don't do certain things. And it's, but it, it means a lot to me, but it's because I know, um, I mean, I don't, you know, I know that we're going to make mistakes. I know, but can you imagine, like, if I'm off on my airspeed when I land, it could really be a big bang or bounce just to, just there's they're so intricate it's the same thing if you're if you're playing an instrument I mean if you play a wrong note everybody knows it because everybody else is just playing what the, what's what's supposed to be played if if you I mean it's okay if you do it but the thing of it is is that there is implications for it and then so it's the same with the body of Christ and so my, my whole point is is that whatever you do the Lord will use use uh, your life to be accurate and that should be your goal not that it's under the law or anything but that the spirit wants to say things and do things because that's how it works it works with words and so Jesus went through this whole thing he started in Genesis with me and talked about how the worlds were created and how effective his words were and then he talked about how he created man in his image. He went through this whole thing. It seemed like it took a longer time than just the 45 minutes I was gone. But the reason I'm telling you this is he created us to rule and reign over everything. And everything, when, when it was created originally, everything would obey. So I, 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 was, I was attuned to this afterwards that... The reason why we don't see certain things happen is because we're not really holding them sacred. 
And we're not treating things sacred. So like when you take communion, it is a sacred holy thing. When you pray in tongues, you are literally handing yourself over to the Holy Spirit. And he is praying out a document. The Lord showed it to me, but I just don't write about it. But he showed me that you're literally, the Holy Spirit is reading a document that is already written about your life or whatever it is that the Spirit's praying out. It's concerning the will of God. It's literally verbatim. It's that sacred. So every penny that you keep is sacred. Every penny you give out or every denomination money, whatever you do, um, the Lord doesn't want you to pay full price for something. He wants you to have the best discounted price as possible. So honestly, I, I mean, you can take this. I mean, I know what I was shown is if I don't, if I don't pray it out for everything and wait on the Lord, even if I paid, um, you know, you know, a certain amount of money over what I could have paid, he saw that as, well, that's money that you could have used for something else. And you just didn't, you weren't diligent because if you wait and you pray, you always can get something at a discounted rate. Or if you can eliminate the middleman, you'll meet somebody and say, well, you know, I'll get it to you for cost. See, God, God can do that. So what happens if you paid full price for something, which is, you know, in your mind, I mean, it's okay because God will make it up. But what I'm saying is, is that for God, that, that's, that's 17 rand or whatever, whatever amount it was, is worth something that was maybe for something else. So I saw that that stuff compiles after a while. And at the end of the year, what you overspent is a lot of money only because you didn't count the sacredness of something. So it's the same with your words. I mean, James clearly says that your tongue is the rudder of your life. It's just like a rudder on a ship. It's a steers the ship and that you should be careful about your words because what you're saying is steering you. So you understand that, that that's how God made the worlds was through words and you understand that God made man in his image. So we know that we're a living spirit inside that speaks from the other realm. So our words are very powerful and you know, I know, I know where we're supposed to be operating and we're not because I saw it. I saw that I could actually tell a string on a guitar to play. I saw that I can sing to a string and make it play because of the, well, the vibration was coming out of my mouth. I saw, I saw all kinds of stuff that, that we're completely that were completely fallen, fallen from. I saw that, we're, that the, the animals used to be able to talk. And that now they can't communicate with us. I see that, I see that they're irritated and they fight each other. You know, I saw, I saw the, dis, this, the, dis, the disconnect. So the Lord really instructed me to be careful with my words and make sure that I'm saying where I'm going, not where I am not where I've been, because um, if I'm, I'm just telling you what he showed me, is that as I'm talking, it would be like, it'd be like uh, steering a vehicle without touching it. Can you imagine like steering your car from your office and, t and just steering it by your words and watching it move? Because that's, that's gonna be possible, that's gonna be possible. Technology will catch up to that. I mean, I saw in the future where I would stand in my studio on a disc, and um, we the the way the cameras were and everything that it would it would make a, a image of me, and then I could project that image all over the world, and that the disc, which was 38, 36 to forty eight inches in American, like a about a meter round, that churches. Or even here, you would just put the disc here and I would stand in my studio and I would be projected here and, and I would teach you for an hour. And it would be hard to tell that it was a projection. 
I saw that already. But I saw that you could, you could change things by your words. So if, you, if the Lord uses words to teach you, to encourage you, but then there's sometimes where there's an admonishment or a correction, then there's also a warning that those are all to steer you. But sometimes God will warn you in order to get you to think about it yourself because it's better if you think about it and you decide to do it rather than like, well, Kevin said to do this and it didn't work. That's like, I don't tell people what I know. I mean, I've had employees, I, did, I didn't tell them for years what I knew because God's going to have to talk to them. And then other employees would come to me and say, well, that, you know, we feel like they're supposed to do this. I go, no, but you're not going to say a word. You know, like God, it took, well, it took two years, but it did happen finally. It's happening right now, in fact, as we speak. But it took, I knew three years ago. But it's not going to be Kevin says, it's going to be God says. And it has to be a confirmation and at the time, I knew it wouldn't be a confirmation because people will do stuff just because of who you are and they, they trust you. But that's not good enough because you, you got to hear from God. So um, with what I notice about Paul is, is that he says things because he's going in a certain direction. He'll say things like this morning, I was getting you to become mature, more mature on a different level because the Lord said it's time for you to be that way. So now you're going to be mindful and think through these things. And, and I mean, it was a lot of notes, except for the cows farting. I mean, everybody will remember that one. But, but I, did that, I do that. The Lord says to, be, to do that and interject that every 10 or 15 minutes is to get them to laugh because it's pretty intense and you need to engage and then it resets you and then you can start over again. And that's why I, do, I bring that in there. It's the Lord says, okay, tell them this. You know, I'm not telling you to say the cow's fart or anything, but that came out. And that was probably me. So he said, he said, we're doing these admonishing and warning and instructing in all wisdom, comprehensive insight into the ways and purposes of God that we may present every person mature, Full grown, fully initiated, complete, and perfect in Christ, the anointed one. Okay, so that's the whole goal. So you got to have all of this. So you can't just have um, just one sided conversation or min mis ministry or messages where it's all grace, you know, because then you have Paul saying, you know, that don't take advantage of your freedom in Christ by sinning, you know, and that, you know, like Paul said, he said this, I mean, think about it. He said, have I now become your enemy because I told you the truth? So it shifted them. So when he did tell them the truth, it shifted people to where they didn't like him anymore. But I've never had that happen. <laughs> but the Lord tells you to say something, then you have to say it. Why? Because the whole idea here is for us to become mature and to be initiated, complete, full grown, and perfect. So I noticed that it's better for God to speak to you and for it to be something that God initiates. And then it's, 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 your, it's it, your process of you hearing it, doing it. It's, it seems a lot better for people. And then they're then the ministry should come in and, and confirm it rather than you just kind of go and tell somebody something, repent or burn, you know, that kind of thing. I mean, nobody wants to hear that, but there are times where that has to be said because that's the warning that person needs. I've had that happen. And I, I mean, I, I was shocked in Bible college. Um, there was a guy uh, that would not talk to me. And I was, I was just a brand new Christian when I went to Bible school. And it was, it was a regular university that was Christian and a four-year degree. And I would try to talk to this guy, and he did not like me. But, you know, it was like I was one of you all, you know. So whatever it was, his little invisible friends didn't like me. 
that kind of thing, you know, that just got irritated, but there was no reason for it. So, um, it kept happening where he was actually rude and mean. He was a pastor's son, so makes a lot of sense, you know. Uh, so anyway, one day, one day, I, was, I remember that the Lord, instead of taking the elevator, I took the stairs. The Lord told me to take the stairs. So, you know, one of those weird things like, why? Just, I need to get the elevator. You know? Took the stairs. He was coming up the stairs. I was going down the stairs. And I stopped him, and I grabbed him by the arm, and I said, you know God loves you. And I said, I pray for you all the time. And he went like this and pulled his arm away. That was Saturday. On Sunday night, he had planned it for a month. He committed suicide the next night. He had planned it for a month. We got all the CDs and all the instructions for his burial for the skull, and all his assets were sent out. He had, he had planned it for a month. And God was reaching out to him one more time. This has happened a couple different times with me. So it can't be just chance. This has happened to me where I was like the last person to talk to this person. And, and I realized, I realized, you know, you read the letter. He, he left it on his chest before he killed himself. And then he mailed out the CDs and his parents got, you know, his instructions for his will and all that. And I'm thinking, you know, the whole time, if like God at the last minute, even though I was probably the last person that would want to do that or the last person he would listen to, the Lord used me because I probably would listen to the Lord. But I didn't even want to talk to that guy because it was just, it was just, you know, guaranteed rejection, guaranteed answer. You know, this is what's going to happen if you talk to this guy. He's, he was mean, you know. I don't even know why he was there, and I, he didn't know why he was there. But the bottom line was, I also, seated beside me in class, I had someone, oh, I just, I felt like, I, I felt like I, I knew him, you know, I didn't know him, but he was really a good friend, really nice guy, and um, I was always telling him, you know, to believe in the supernatural, because this school didn't really teach that. You know, they believed in it on paper, but they were a denomination now, and they were, I guess, too mature for the Holy Spirit. <laughs> but they, uh, they would teach stuff like, and they would talk about how it used to be. And it's a big denomination. You would know what, who it is. But now they're even questioning if they're supposed to cast out devils or not, or if God heals anymore, you know. But there was a time where that's the reason it was formed, from Azusa Street, actually, from Azusa Street in California in 1906. And they formed in 1914 in Hot Springs, Arkansas. And um, this guy was in these classes. And I'm, I'm like realizing I'd, I felt like I'd made a mistake by even being at that college. And I wanted to actually go back and, um, you know, back to what my, my first plan was before I got saved. And that was go be a fighter pilot, be a, be, go to the Air Force Academy. And um, I was like, Lord, why am I here? The, I gave up everything for a denomination that doesn't even believe anymore. Well, this guy got cancer. So he's, he's, he's sitting with me in class, and he raises his hand, and he tells the professor that he won't be able to take the final exam and that could he take it early because um, they only give him um, like six weeks to live, and they can't operate. So they're, they're sending him home to die. So he, he had, uh, you know, the, he showed me the, the x-rays, and there were all these, you know, areas on his lungs that was cancer, you know, it was like dark spots. And so I just, like, as soon as he did that, you know, no one responded, let's pray. So I just laid hands on him. Now, I've only been a, saved like six months. I just laid hands on him and rebuked the cancer and told it to leave. And um, the next semester, he's back in class. And he's, like, standing in front of the class with both sets of x-rays, one where he has it, one where he doesn't. Okay, so the, this, this is the kind of thing that I'm, that I'm sent out all over the world to teach is you've got to listen to the Spirit because what you're involved with in any situation, it might be corrupt or ineffective, and you might be the only one. 
that is a, that can do this. So a person, so so uh, when I was ten years old, I was part of a denomination that doesn't believe in the Holy Spirit, which doesn't make them Christian, but they they call themselves Christians, and we weren't allowed to tell people about the Lord because they believed that God had already ordained some to go to hell and some to go to heaven. So my pastor wouldn't let me witness to anybody because he said, you might mess up God's plan and a person who is going to hell might go to heaven and they're not supposed to. I'm not making this up. So I was not, they, they told me, I go, well, what does it say about God so loved the world that he gave his only son? What if he, it says, doesn't it say that, you know, that, that he doesn't wish that anyone should perish? He goes, I don't have your answer. I'm just telling you what the synod said. And they know the Pharisees that, you know, vote this stuff in. And I'm like, so what about being born again? He goes, I don't know anything about that. I had never heard about being born again until somebody told me about it. Okay, so we went to kids camp. So at kids camp, you know, it's supposed to be Bible school, but it's, it's camping. But... They don't believe in the Holy Spirit. They don't believe in healing. I mean, what's, what, what's, you know, they don't believe in salvation. So, like, what you, but they believe in camping and hot dogs and things like that. So, so I'm sitting at their fire and we're just sitting and all this pastor would do is tell jokes and st- stupid stories. And, and he would read out of a book for the sermon. He wouldn't have his own sermons or anything. And I thought, you know, there's got to be more than this. So this was at 10 years old. I was camping, and this lady, she was like a, I, I think a relative of somebody who was there, and she came up like for a day or two, and she was just hanging out. And um, she just like took over the campfire. She's one of those crazy Holy Spirit people. and uh, But I didn't know anything about it. And and so she she said, you know, I'd like to share a story with the kids. So all the kids are like, yeah, anything better than this pastor. They're like... <laughs> So this is what she says. She said, um, I was diagnosed with a brain tumor that was inoperable because it was in a place where they couldn't take it out. It was too big. And she said, um, so I was given up to die. This was at 10 years old. And that's how it all started with me to where I can lay hands on people and do what I'm doing. Because I, at, this lady said that somebody came into the hospital room with a bottle of oil and, and she doesn't believe this way because she believes like us, which is at the time was nothing, you know, we believe nothing. So, so she said um, the lady went to put the oil on her forehead and anoint her to be healed, but she didn't even know about healing. And she said, well, I, I'll, I'll do the praying. Well, she ended up just taking the whole oil and dumping it on her hair and just, and then left. Okay, so... Something, something in the process of it, I guess some other surgeon said, well, let me, let me get another set of MRIs or whatever you call it, cat scans, elephant scans, whatever, you know, they're called, you know, and, and, um, so when they did, he, he was like, I might be able to operate on this. So the bottom line is it had gotten smaller, so they went in and he took it out. And when he took it out, they took a, what you call biopsy of it. They, they poke inside and they take a portion of it out. When he poked it, it was the oil that that lady had poured on her. It, that's all was in it. It was just all oil. So as a child, I remember that. And so... I want to tell you this because that lady will get such a great reward because she's the reason I got saved, one of the reasons I got saved. But she's the reason that I had hope to believe for supernatural things because I had never had any element of that in any teaching. And I was restricted, and my parents were very strict about it and really involved with those, those type of churches. So I was shut out. And that gave me that element as a little child to always believe God. So I would read the Old Testament because as an unsaved person, I could understand the Old Testament because it was all stories. I couldn't understand the New Testament until I got saved. And I remember reading the Bible and um, I went to work when I was in high school 
I just gotten, I just gotten, I just graduated. And I had this assignment for this company where I had to re, uh, report somewhere. And one of the employees had a pin on his lapel and said, born again. And I said, born again? What does that mean? I said, he said, well, Jesus said, I go, yeah, but, but my church d- did never could give me an explanation for it. He said, well, everyone has to be born again in order to go to heaven. I go, I've never been told that. My church told me I needed to be sprinkled, become a church member, and then if I'm good on the day I die and God was in a good mood that he would let me in. And he goes, oh, no, no, Jesus said you got to be born again. And, and so he says, you know what you need to do? He said, when you get home, you need to kneel down in your room and you need to give your life to God and ask to be born again. So that's what I did. I got home from work. I went and knelt down in my, uh, I was ready to go to the Air Force Academy and I knelt down and I said, Lord, if you'll be to me like you were to that lady that got healed of the tumor, and if you'll be to me like the people in the Old Testament, I said, I said, if you'll take me, I'll be, I'll, I'll give you my whole life and I'll be born again right now. And the power of God hit me in my room with no offering, no preaching, nobody waving a jacket over me or you know anything. I got saved. I got born again very powerfully, and I had total miracles happen to me. I got baptized in the Holy Spirit driving in a snowstorm. I don't know if you have snow down here, do you? Mm. It was so bad. When it, you know how it happened? It happened, I couldn't, I couldn't uh, for some reason make the connection, but I knew that it was given, the Holy Spirit was given already. So um, I was in a snowstorm get, going to work right shortly after I got saved. And um, <clears throat> as I turned the corner, getting outside of, of the farmland where I lived, got onto a highway and uh, somebody swerved into me and the car went right through me. But it, di- it, didn't, it went right through me to the other side and I started speaking in tongues. There was a flash of light. I watched the guy hit me and go through me, but I didn't feel anything. And there was a bright light and I, I got baptized in the Holy Spirit. So it was by, by myself again. So, so, you know, now, now you can see why, even though, you know, I had all this education and I went and flew for an airline, not as a pilot, just as a flight attendant, that I could never accept what was the temperature that was going on because I had been, I'd had so many things happen to me without the, without the church being involved. In fact, the church actually kept me out. When I got saved, the church actually shut down where I was going because the whole youth group, which was 16 kids, they all left, got saved. I led them to the Lord, and they went to, we found a church that believed in the born-again experience. So the church folded. And the pastor called my parents in and, and me in and said, you'll have to answer to Jesus Christ and why you split my church. That's over just telling them they need to be born again. Okay, so you can imagine, maybe you understand me a little better now, is I'm not putting up with fake when there's a world that's dying going to hell. And people need to be warned and told things because people were bold enough to tell me something that, that they, 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 they actually were part of everything that you enjoy now. Is because I was given hope. I was given a pathway. And, that, and I see that for the, your kids too, is you should always present the supernatural to them. You should always give them the alternative to ask God for help first. Get, teach them to pray first. Teach them to believe God first. And, and, and encourage them to not wait for someone else to do it for them. You know, America is not the land of opportunity anymore. It used to be that you could just have a thought and you can, you can have it as a business the next day. And, and things like that have happened in different countries at different times. But see, now it's a lot harder. And it's the same with the spiritual atmosphere. I've noticed that it's just not as easy anymore to do the things that God is asking you to do. You, you, have, to, you have to have a, an, extra, an extra edge about you that's not there. And I notice this. Um, 
I know it's about myself, not being aggressive enough and, and being backward. And, and, you know, it got to where the things that the, that the examiners would say to me, he says, you know, you're getting a captain's rating. What I, need you to, what I need to see is you giving out commands to the first officer and you're not doing it. So I was asking, please, and, you know, can you do this for me? And it's like, no, you say it, gear down. You, you say all these things. And I just, I'm just very kind. I'm like, you know, if you have time, put the gear down. You know, it's like, no, you know, it's like, no, you say it. So, I, I mean, I was talked to many times. And, you know, you know our pilots like uh, Sven and Lou and those people that are my mentors, they, they've been very patient. But they were like, we need to see a command. And then with the FAA, they are like, the one thing that I want to talk to you, you pass, but we need to see you be more commanding and, and taking, it, taking control, taking accountability for things. And, and it, I've had to change. But I noticed this about the spiritual atmosphere changing to where it's not like it used to be. Things are not easy anymore, and nobody wants to say anything. People are not getting healed as much anymore. The devils are laughing at you when you tell them to do something. And... Uh, you know, things are not always uh, working out the first time you do it. Like, things are not, like, perfect. Um, I, I've been in those times in my life where, but I just wanted to tell you these things because the way Paul talks about it is that sometimes there's different approaches that you have to have. And sometimes God will teach you. He'll, he'll ask you. There's other times where Jesus, his personality is, you'll do this or you will be held accountable for it. And I just had that happen two weeks ago before I came here. And he, I, I, I had a talk that I didn't think I would ever have with him. And he told me, he goes, you'll either do this, because I put my foot down, he said. If you don't put your foot down, you will stand before me and, and be held accountable. Because he said, he said, literally millions of people are watching you. And if you lower the standard in any way, he said, then that lowers the standard of everybody. And he said, at this time, he said, it's unacceptable. You need to have it so that people come up to the standard that we're supposed to be at. And so you need to say these things and you need to enforce these things. And I'm like, well, people are still trying to deal with why certain things happen. Because a lot of things appear to come through and, and, and happen to you that you would think the angels would prevent from happening. And you think about, okay, you've been told if you give, you know, these things will happen. And so... The Lord says, you got to tell them that because they, were, they gave out a compulsion, they were, they were pressured to give, that it wasn't um, a cheerful giver and that um, it wasn't worship. And I, <clears throat> I'm just telling you what I, I mean, I'm going to get, you know, I'm going to get, people are going to be upset, but the Lord told me that, that because they didn't give with the right attitude, there wasn't the return until they repented of that. So that's why when Kathy and I are stolen from, we said, no, we gave that. We gave that to them. They didn't steal it. We gave it. We don't let the devil have any edge on that. We, we give more when we're stolen from. When people steal from us, we give them more money. We do things for them. Because we don't want Satan to feel like he's in control of the situation. So you should never give anything unless you check it out with the Lord and you're supposed to do it. Especially even if it's a tithe. It should be a place where you're receiving from. You, wherever your storehouse is is where you receive from. If, you, if you're receiving, then you, you need to tithe to that. If you don't believe in tithing, then don't tithe. Give 50% or 100%. Don't give it, you know, 10%. You know, if you don't believe in 10%, that's fine. No, what I'm saying is, is that you determine in your heart. Paul said, take the offerings before I come so that there's no arm twisting and that people aren't giving emotionally. So I have to say these things because that's what Paul is talking about. He's admonishing, he's correcting, and he's saying, listen, I'm not even taking the offering. This is for Jerusalem, but take it before I get there so that there's no um, compulsion here. Don't give out a compulsion. Give because you, are, you have the revelation of what you're doing and it's what God says. So, so Kathy and I, when we give, we get, 
we get numbers that are way bigger than we would give. But when I check with her, it's the same number. Like, that's impossible. And one time the Lord told me, somebody that didn't like me, I mean, really didn't like me, the Lord told me to give him $50,000 American, which is my whole salary for the year. And this is before the ministry. And so I, I said, well, then you talk to Kathy about it. Because I, I, I thought, you know, there's no way. That's her purse money. You know, no, I'm just kidding. She got the same amount. And so we gave it. And I guess now I'm a real man of God <laughs> to that person. And, and from that point on, the heavens were open. But that's the way it should be. It should be something where God tells you to do something and then you, you purposely do it. It's the same thing when you say something. Do you really want to go what you, or where you're say, what you're saying? Are you really wanting to go there? Because the other thing that bothers me, and these are all under this, this Colossians 128, where we're supposed to be giving our message and preaching, but we're, it says here, awaken hearts with these, these types of, of, of ways of delivering the message of truth. It is sometimes is sometimes you have to be brutally honest and say something that doesn't even exist and say, I know where I'm going and the facts are this, but the truth is this. And the truth is different than facts because the facts are just observation. But where your destination is might not be known. Abraham didn't know where he was going. And God told him, just go, and I'll tell you when you get there. You know, and that's the, that was attributed to his faith. So are you, willing, are you willing to allow God to speak through you? I mean, can you imagine? I'm 31 years old, and I'm not married. And I had been to heaven. And after I'd been to heaven, I wasn't sure that I wanted to be married. Because I saw that everything what Paul was saying was true. It's better that you be alone, you know. But you don't know that until you're out of your body and you're never going to kiss a girl again. And there is no marriage up there. And, and you could care less. And you can't even imagine it. It's that low-level earthly stuff, you know, <laughs> marriage, all that stuff. I couldn't believe it. But I got back in my body, and I'm like, oh, gee, here we go. And so I'm 31 years old, and now I'm, I'm, I'm really confused because I know that Paul's right, but yet my body's saying, you know, this. And I'm thinking, okay, Lord, what do you say? And he goes, your land shall be married. I go, is that a verse? And he goes, yes. And so I found it, and I started confessing it. And then he told me, he took me, he would take me outside. He said, see those stars up there? He said, your wife is under the same stars right now. So pray for her. So I would pray for her all the time. And then one night, the Lord said to me, you're go you know, he actually came, this is just shortly after I came back. I was in my car, and um, I went to get out of it to go in the house, and someone, I couldn't see anybody, but I mean, my car went down like somebody sat in it, and the power of God was so strong, just like now, because it always comes when I start talking about this, and um, the Lord sat in my car and said, you're going to this city tomorrow, you're going to take this flight, and you're going to meet your wife. You're going to this church. I mean, I've never been to this city. I got on that plane, and it just so happened that Kathy was there on the second row in that church. And when I walked in, she was sitting there, and the Lord said, that's your wife. And we were married four months later. And we've been married for over 30 years. <laughs> you 
I would rather everyone live this way, uh, even though you say, well, you know, all that supernatural stuff. But see, the thing it is, is the supernatural doesn't come when you can do it yourself. And that's the whole idea, like with, uh, especially in prosperous countries where you can pretty much do anything you want and you don't have to trust God as much. Do you understand what I'm saying? In the Old Testament times and in the New Testament times, the early church, you didn't have the medical help and everything else that you have now. So there, in certain countries, you either believe God or you die. And there's this, you trust God for your finances where, you know, in America, you can, you can blindfold yourself and walk 300 paces and, and get a job at wherever it is you stop and take. There's, there's jobs everywhere, even as bad as it is. And, and, and the, the, the opportunities are different in different times and different cultures and different countries. So the gospel that Jesus taught me when I was with him is, is that you have to be able to preach this anywhere and it has to work. So if you're going to teach prosperity, so what he did was he told me to go to the poorest, uh, uh, where's, uh, one of my employees, we're going there to Puerto Rico. We're going to one of the poorest cities. And um, so I went there and the first time I went there, there was only like 15 or 20 people that showed up, but I, I still had to do it. And they get hit with a hurricane every season. And the Lord said, you go there and you teach on authority and you teach them how to poke the eye out of a hurricane and take authority and command it to deflect. And so that started to happen where it didn't hit that side of the island anymore. Okay. The next time I went, he said, because if you're going to teach on authority and the winds and the waves obey you, you know, just like Jesus gave us authority over all that stuff. Well, why isn't it working? So should, if God is, a, is going to prosper everybody, then it sh you should be able to go to the poorest place and teach it and it should work. So I, the next year I had to preach on prosperity at that town. So I taught on financial miracles and supernatural finances, not necessarily get rich, but I, I said, you know, God wants to prosper you and help you it, with your finances. He wants to take you from where you're at. And if anybody on the island should, should be doing better, it should be you because you're serving God and, and you're, you're supporting what God's doing. And I just taught them the biblical principles, didn't teach them how to get rich. I told them how to get supernatural finances. And it started to happen because they weren't even being able to pay their bills. And we, we, were, we were, as a ministry, having to help them every year, which is fine. And we're going to do it again in a couple of weeks. But the bottom line is, is this, is everything that you believe and teach, it should work everywhere. Even, even when there's diseases, and I wasn't even allowed... I wasn't even allowed to go places. I would go to my studio and I would record from my studio every week and I would tell the devil, I'm going to do this every week until you stop it. So I went for weeks and months and I taught on healing. I prayed for people to be healed. Then when they let us go in where it was still bad, but they just, they let us as long as we stayed six feet apart and masks on. And of course, after you get in there, the police said, just take your mask off and you can do what you want. I would hug people, pray for people. I never got it. I've, I've never gotten any of those diseases ever. But I was around people that had it. But I thought, you know, if Jesus laid hands on leprosy, I mean, if you touch leprosy, you get it. I mean, there's communicable, communicable diseases that contact, well, you know, and Jesus never got any of those diseases, but he touched people. And I thought, well, this is like where, the only reason I'm saying all this is because if we really believe, then we should believe in the worst t pandemic as well. I mean, just to be honest, but no one else is going to talk like this because what happens is, is the accountability comes back on us. So you could practice 
until you are literally perfect. Everything is predictable with anything. And that's what professionals do. You look at all these people that do these things. You don't know that they're doing this all the time. So we learned in college, you know, if you want to be a professional in anything, whether it's a musician or a golfer or a pilot, like when I, when we t- I taught students, I tell them, you've got to fly more than twice a week. When you're a musician, you have to practice at least twice a week just to maintain what you have, to maintain it. And this is across the board, and you can look this up. It's on the Internet, so it must be true, right? But... <laughs> But um, at the third day a week, you start to improve. But the errors start to go down dramatically at the third day or session. So if a person could play golf, they determined it would have to be six days a week to be a professional. And that seventh day actually is really good as a reset. But it's total immersion in order to do... so. I've. I've done, you've done this with your profession. Some of you have done this with sports and things like that. I've tested it out and, and, and become very, very accurate at certain things because I just did it all the time. And you can get to where you're error free. It's predictable because it becomes a part of you. So you have to get this way now in your walk so that when things start to get tight and things start to not be as predictable, you're still predictable and you stay the course. That's how Jesus was. And that's how he was with me. If you wanted to know what his personality was, he was like that. So he said, listen, you can't keep just talking all the time. And so I had to correct that. He also said something that really offends a lot of people, but he did not joke. He can't say something because he'll get it. He can't say what they call perverse speech or twisted speech in, in, in the, in the uh, biblical languages. You can't say something but mean something else. And so Jesus, when he talks, he, he, he literally has calculated what he wants to say because he wants to get truth to you because he wants you to have what he has. So he, he, you... You have to say where you're going, and you have to say this over your children. You got to do it for them until they're old enough to pick it up themselves. All right, so he said, It has become my inspiration and passion in ministry to labor with a tireless intensity, with his power flowing through me, to present to every believer the revelation of being his perfect one in Jesus Christ. And so because people say, you know, oh, you can't be perfect. Well, we know that as far as, as far as, far as like, like uh, the fact that tongues is not going to cease until we're perfect, until we're perfected in love, all the gifts of the Spirit are going to be in there, but when the, to- the tongues will cease when we reach perfection. But see, tongues can't have ceased because I haven't met anybody perfect, and we need the help of the Spirit right now. And that's that's. A- but he's saying that we can follow the Spirit perfectly, which might mean that He routes you in a certain direction in order to accomplish what He has you to do. For me, I would have to take a portion of whatever I was learning. And, and do it a thousand times. I would have to do a sequence of events, whether it be something like, like what I'm dealing with now with a, a very complicated airplane. It's got 10 or 15 steps more for each thing than I have to do with my other airplane. Because it's an older airplane, it's bigger, it's more complicated, but it's, the one I have is, is modern. So I can do a couple of things and I can fly it by myself. Where this one, you, you can't fly it by yourself. you got to have somebody else. But the only thing is there's many more steps. And there's just no way when, after you land to, to be able to do all this stuff and still like do all the other things you need to do. But you're supposed to be able to do it. 
And so what I have to do is I have to sit there. Kathy set it up in my Every time I, we get a, another airplane or another rating that I'm getting, we set up the whole cockpit there. I have all the picture there, and I go through every button in sequence. Okay, just landed. So now I got to do this, this, and this. And I got to turn this on, turn this off. And I got to tell the captain, go here, and then start, start the APU and start all these... Uh, turn this off, turn the radar off so the guys on the ground don't get cooked by the radar, you know, as you're taxiing back. And I'm doing all this stuff, and I'm thinking, how am I ever going to do this? And then on these last flights, I was completely able to do it. And I don't understand how. All of a sudden, it just happened. Well, this is the way that our life is supposed to be, is that the Spirit's supposed to be able to teach us to do these things as common things. So if you're supposed to be married, then your land shall be married. And it doesn't matter what happens. But God will speak that to you, and then it will happen. If you're supposed to have a certain job, or you're supposed to meet a certain standard, and you can't even pass your test, well, it doesn't matter. If God says that's what you're going to do, then you got to rise to the occasion. And um, I mean, I, I, I have done this with 14 different instruments. Never had a lesson in any of them. But I have locked myself in a dark room with no lessons, and I have learned to play in the dark, praying in the Spirit. All the instruments in any key. But I had, I mean, I'm talking eight hours a day. I'm hearing something in my head, just playing it until I could play what I was hearing. And see, now I hear my parts before I play them. Well, we don't even know what we're going to play next, but I can hear where we're going and, if, if, and we communicate with each other, says, you know, go here, do this. This is a part of the world that we used to always operate in before the fall. We had dominion over everything, it says in the Bible. I mean, everything. We didn't have to work. Everything came to us. Think about it. Adam and Eve didn't have to work. Can you imagine their first day of work? They used to get the help to do that, you know. Now they got to labor. It was a bad day, that first day out of the garden. Okay, so all the Word of God is for correction, admonishment, teaching, and to steer you. But Paul's technique was trying to get people to see their need by telling them, listen, I used to be to where the things that I would want to do, I couldn't do. But the things that I didn't want to do, I found myself doing. And he would say, wretched man that I am. And then chapter 8 of Romans comes, because that was chapter 7. But praise be to God through Jesus Christ. Now there is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus, who, who, not, who don't live by the flesh, but by the Spirit. Because if you live by the flesh, you cannot please God. In fact, you're an enemy of God, it says. And he just goes on. And by the, at the end of that chapter, he's like, who can separate us from the love of God? We're more than conquerors. He talks you through, but he starts in Romans 7. Okay, the reason I'm teaching this is I'm trying to show you that in Romans 7, most Christians identify with Romans 7. They go, yeah, that's like me, Paul. The things I want to do, I can't do. I find myself doing the things I don't want to do, and I'm, the struggle is real, you know? And so what happens is, is you, you find ministries that will make you feel okay about that. Well, you know, we're all in that same boat. No one's perfect. Well, if that's the attitude, I don't want you flying my airplane. <laughs> like, I don't, want a, I don't want you to have that attitude toward hardware or my children. You know, I don't want you teaching my children because that's going to be transferred down to them. And then you've given me a problem. So when you hand, you know, that's why I, I even tell Kathy, I said, we got to be careful who we listen to, you know, the, the ministers we listen to, what we watch, everything that we're involved with, because it, it does, it does, I mean, I was surprised at some of the things the Lord said, you know, you're wrong in this. And I was like attached to people that were teaching a certain way. And when I, I was a shock when the Lord showed me, I'm like, I would have never saw that. 
I go, I was deceived, but I didn't know it. And things work for a while. The only thing is, is that what about those who are being neglected? And so the spirit wants to, to make you effective and perfect. This is not being taught. But see, there is no company that would hire you if you were lackadaisical towards safety. I mean, you, you have like the, the safety institutions we have with the FAA. I actually like the FAA. Most people don't like the FAA, but I like the FAA because they're, they promote safety. I, they're my friend. I like it when people are helping me to stay in line and, and be safe. You know, so I don't see like certain things as being wrong. Jesus is like that. He corrects you, but it's because he loves you and he, he cares. You <laughs> All right. Three fifteen. Okay. All right. First Thessalonians four sixteen says, "For the Lord Himself will descend from heaven with a loud cry of summons, with a shout of the archangel, and with the blast of the trumpet of God." This these things are going to happen. And those who have departed this life in Christ will rise first. Okay, that is going to happen. So it says that those who were in Christ that already died and are buried are going to rise first when this trumpet happens. Okay, but it's the ones in Christ. Okay, this, I wanted to show this to you because it's so solid it's so solid what's going to happen and what Jesus is all, and God has already said that even though your body is in a grave or even cremated or whatever, it doesn't matter. It, I mean, I, I, I didn't have um, any more questions when I was in heaven. I had, there was no questions left. I mean, up there, everything is answered at the throne. There are no questions. You can't think of a question up there. You can't. I try to think of something to ask, and I could not. I understood everything. But then when I came back and I, I attached back to my biological parts, my mind, I couldn't, I couldn't um, somehow pull everything, you know, here. And, and there was no, like, congruency. So, like, a lot of things, I'm not, I, they became blurry again. And it's been years. Some things come to me, you know, right away. Some things haven't come back to me at all. But I saw... That, that trumpet has enough authority that it will, it will take every speck of dust, every part of your body, and it will come back together again. And you will be assembled again, and, and you will be, you will be, you'll be, you'll be, have your body, and you'll go, you'll go up. I also saw that we get a resurrection, another body, I was shown that, and I was like, wait, what? And, and I, I saw my body on the table, but then I saw a, we get another body. And I, I saw what I looked like in comparison to my glorified body, which was on the table when I was being operated on. The Lord glorified, I, I saw it, I looked down, I had, was out of my body, I had a robe of righteousness on. But I also get my body back, but it's resurrected and glorified. And the only way that you can tell who you are up in heaven in that body is you have to look into the person's eyes. There's nothing physical that you can recognize when that happens. So these people that go to heaven and say they've seen their relatives and things like that, that is not the resurrection that has not happened yet. The resurrection hasn't happened. That, um, what you get... At that point is what Adam and Eve looked like before the fall. You're glorified. It's a total, I mean, I, I, I had to look away. I couldn't look at myself. I had to look away. 
there was such perfection there. And then I understood why we were made in the image of God. And I understood why the devil beats us all down here. He beats us down. He just, when I saw what we look like, and I saw that I had to look into people's eyes to say, hey, is that you? You know, because that we didn't, we looked like God. But that'll get you kicked out of church. But we looked like our Father God. I, I, and and I'm, I'm telling you this because our origin can't be known until this happens. We can't know how we were made before the fall until this happens. But I'm telling you, you're going to kick yourself. If you don't listen to what I'm saying and, and engage God without limitations down here, you're, you're going to kick yourself when you get to heaven because you're going to see that there was a pathway through the word of God and through the spirit to overcome a lot of things down here. Okay, so I wanted to point out that those in Christ are going to rise first and that their bodies, which were in the graves, are going to come forth and that that is going to happen, which is a total miracle. All right, also... First Thessalonians 5.18, thank God in everything, no matter what the circumstances may be, be thankful and give thanks for this is the will of God for you who are in Christ Jesus, the revealer and the meditator, the mediator of his will. <clears throat> so if we're in Christ, it says here that he is the revealer and the mediator. And what I saw was, is that a lot of people, they don't like daily go to Jesus to, and ask him for a revelation of, of the will of God and mediate the will. So you got to understand, it's not just, okay, I have a will, I found out I'm in, I'm in a will, and that there's all these benefits. But the, the person who reveals that is actually the mediator, the, the, the attorney that sits down with you. And, and works on both sides of it to make sure that it gets done and that everybody's in agreement. So it's, it's, it's more than what we've been presented. And I saw this with Jesus. that He doesn't just say, do this or else, you know, go to Africa. You know, he doesn't say, like, you're going to Africa. You know, you're leaving everything, you're going to Africa. And then, you know, you, you work yourself. In our, everybody in America thinks that Africa is cannibals, you know, in the jungle. <laughs> I'm serious. It's like, or, or, you know, safari, you know. So like, you know, and, and everybody you talk to, they don't want to go to the altar when you ask them to come up. In America, they don't want to come to the altar call to answer a call to, to be a missionary or be even a minister because you might get sent to Africa. <laughs> I'm serious. Uh, so everybody's afraid for God to call them. I'm serious. But Jesus, when he sits down with you, and he, it's saying here in Thessalonians that he reveals, you're to ask him, he's the revealer of the will of God, but he's also the mediator, which means he's not going to just say, sign these papers, I'll be back in 10 minutes, and um, you're going to do this or else, you know. He's, it's, 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 it's literally something that he has planned for you personally. And he wants you, you to, to be in the center of God's will. And so he wants to explain it all to you and then make sure that it all is implemented and understood. See, I've never been told this. In fact, one of the, the two questions that I've always had and that I always get are, I want to hear the voice of God and I want to know the will of God. Those are the two big questions. And, 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 and this is something that on the other side of this and in all the scripture, when you study, those should be the two paramount things that happen constantly with a Christian. I mean, according to scripture in a perfect world. But why is it lacking is because of teaching and because of, of lack of discipleship and having people work alongside you and say, well, I don't sense that. That's not what God, I don't think God's saying that, but let's pray. So, and that's why, like, uh, you know, if you're going to come up and prophesy, I'm going to say, well, what's the Lord saying to you? And, I, and run it through me. And I'm like, well, 
that is not even scriptural. It doesn't match what, what we're saying here. I don't bear witness with that right now. Why don't you go pray that out? And that's what Paul said. Listen, if you're going to prophesy, let the congregation judge. So how many would really come up if the whole congregation was going to either give you the thumbs up or thumbs down on it? And that's what would happen in Azusa Street. Azusa Street, the Holy Spirit would choose the, when the move of God started in 1908, they, they, 1906, they, it wasn't the same person. They would wait on God and then someone would rise up. And if it wasn't what the spirit, they would yell, sit down and shut up. They would, they would say, that's not the message, you know. And that's kind of more like in line with what Paul was saying. Okay, so if in this case, how many of you have really been mentored with what I'm saying is that God will sit with you and not only, you know, not only inform you of what, what is yours, but then will also mediate it, will actually help you with the paperwork, so to speak, you know. See, all of us aren't really equipped. And, and I noticed this with, with even with the company I work for, for an airline. I mean, I would make mention of certain things. I says, you know, there's a gap here and a lot of people are failing. So let's change this because for some reason, people are not getting this. I'm noticing this out out on the job that, that people aren't doing this or forgetting this, whatever. So we got to really emphasize it because it's a safety concern. And so I was, I was, you know, always looking at things like that to help. And I was, I was asked to do that. And then, and let the company know. And I feel like that's what the Holy Spirit's supposed to be doing in our lives according to Scripture is to monitor everything and help us. So he wants to help us pray. So there's times where he's going to say, you're going to do this, you're going to say this. I mean, that's, it's Spirit-led. I don't just pray. I let the Holy Spirit talk to me. So how many of you, you really feel like you really, you really feel like you've been mentored by, by ministry. I mean, have you been mentored by the fivefold? You have? How, how, many, how, how many feel like they have? Well, that's unacceptable. That's probably 10 or 15%. I mean, I'm, I'm just saying, if I had a flight school, I mean, you would be, you'd be going in an airplane with, if you weren't sure. I mean, the neighborhood would want you flying over them, you know? So... <laughs> Okay, so why would, uh, why, would, uh, why would God trust you with the sword of the Spirit? You know, if you're going to swing that sword, if you're not informed and, and you know. See, when, when, you, when you see it from the other side, uh, I'm telling you, you have a lot of authority. And God trusts you with a lot of things, but I don't, I don't think we're convinced I mean, uh, I'm talking about dominion. You know, everybody talks about authority over the devil. And, you know, I'm talking dominion here. I'm talking stomping my foot and saying, not on my watch. And having dominion and saying, no, we're not going to. And this is unacceptable. And, and when people start seeing that we need to step it up, then everybody starts joining with it. Then the quality, the excellence goes up in everything because someone says, you know, has to discern and that's the way the Spirit mentors people, is that, listen, something's wrong here. It's not working. And you got to remember that in the, even in the Old Testament, God would defeat the enemies by giving them a bad dream, and they would get scared. <laughs> remember that one time um, with Gideon where that, that big cake barley loaf rolled into the camp, and they had a guy had a dream, and they started getting scared. There's this big barley loaf. The Israelis were going to come in and roll over them in, in a dream. And it got around and it started, it says it started to undermine. The Lord started to undermine their confidence. So this is what the Lord would do if you just pray. Versus like, you know, buying a bunch of tanks and airplanes and going to war, you know. What if God would just fight your battles like that where... But I, I'm telling you the other side of this is that I saw that a lot of things could be taken care of in your spiritual life by prayer where it undermines the evil spirits that are operating and then the people are not any longer able to operate in whatever evil they're operating in. 
And the, the witches, uh, they don't, it doesn't work anymore. They can't control. You keep showing up, you don't die. You just keep showing up. It's like it doesn't work, you know. Well, it worked for everybody else. I'm not everybody else, you know. All right. 2 Timothy 1 1 says, I, Paul the Apostle, special messenger of Christ, Jesus, by the will of God, according to the promise of life that is in Christ Jesus. So you see, Paul was called, and everything that he said was is that it was the will of God for him to be who he was and do what he was. And it was according to the promise of life that was in Christ Jesus. So we'll leave it right here until tonight. But the whole idea is, is that the church was established, the body was established. All of us, according to Acts 17, were known because it says that God knew every generation and who would live where on the earth at what time. We were all appointed to be there. And it's not random. And that the, the God's plan was the church and the, the body and he's the head of it. And I feel like the onslaught that we all go through every day is to kind of get our attention away from uh, these basic things like this, knowing that we don't have to prove that we're the church. We are the church already. We've been appointed. All of us, it says that the Spirit has given as he wills gifts in each one, severally as he wills. And then God sets in the church some to be apostles, prophets, pastors, teachers, evangelists. So there's this, there's this surety of certain things that are going to happen. We know there's going to be a thousand-year reign. We know that certain things are going to happen. They're set in stone. They're going to happen. God is in control of that timeline at his appointed time. However, the other things that are in between are really up to us and taking authority. And no one wants to admit that if we are the responsible ones, then we need to pray against certain things or it won't be done. So all of you are supposed to be bringing things in from the other realm and mani letting the Spirit manifest towards the body, which means there's songs to be written. There's, there's songs in heaven that, are, that need to come down here. There's books that need to be written. There's, there's people that need to hear you say something to them because it starts a domino effect where it's touching many, many lives by one word to one person that seems insignificant to you. But you'll see this. You'll see where what you did for one person ends up being hundreds of thousands of people in a lifetime. One person that you help and they are activated, then they go forth. So you're, you expect that God has planted and done these things, established seed time and harvest, but we need to sow the word. Because the, the way that it works is you sow the word and then it produces a crop. So we sow the word, he brings the increase, but it, we work together. And you have to discern in the time that we live in that there's a lot of things that we're supposed to be doing in order for God to do what he needs to do. So and unless the harvest comes in, there won't be a rapture or a second coming. There are two different things, two different words, two different events. There's some that won't make the rapture. And I'm not the boss, so I'm not the one, thank God, I'm not seated on that throne. I don't have any of those, those uh, decisions to make. But those who love is appearing, who expect him, who have their oil ready, I feel that I'm assigned and I feel you're assigned with me to prepare the body so that when the bridegroom comes, that there are five wise virgins, that there are lambs and not, the goats I'm not worried about and the, and the, the, the tares I'm not worried about, the, the, the wheat I am. I'm only concerned about those that God has assigned me to. So the unsaved I'm assigned to. But those who are going to resist the word, the religious people, you know, they're goats. They're Pharisees. 
Jesus called them the sons of Satan, offspring of the devil. He said, who's warned you the coming wrath? He was actually mad that they had been warned. He thought they were coming out to repent. If you come out to repent, he was like, who's warned you? Because he didn't. He had that attitude, but I want all of you to be ready with, with the oil and have everything trimmed and ready so that when the bridegroom comes, you're ready. But one will be taken, one will not. So within the realm of things that are set in motion, how about us praying out in the spirit and letting God reveal what his will is? Because I'm, what I've told you is, is that yes, there's amazing things that have, have happened. I've seen miracles, but I will be honest with you. I also practice a lot. I also do things over and over again. And I think that we watch golf and we want to golf like we watch the professionals, but they do it six days a week. And if you did it six days a week, you'd be on TV too. But, but it's the same thing with Christianity. We look at people, we say, well, they're just gifted. They, you know, Kevin went to heaven. You know, that's what I hear all the time. It's like, yeah, but I, that, that should have never had to happen. I should have been able to, to read the Bible and know that everything that I learned in heaven was in the Bible. And I should have known it. And that's what Jesus told me. You should have known these things that were given to you. They're in your, the word. He said, they're treasure, though. You have to dig for them. They're not on the surface. He said, that, he said they're not on the surface. The things that you are to know, you have to dig for. He told me that. It's not in my book, but that's what he told me. He said, most people are just looking for the easy gems on the surface, you know. But you got a mind for the good stuff. And, and um, this is what the Spirit's saying. So be excellent in what you do. I'll, I'll, I'll also tell you that David, I saw David practicing every day with his slingshot. I saw him playing the harp. And I saw him practicing. He used to pick targets and sit there all day with the sheep. Under a, he was under a tree. And he would sit there and just pick targets and practice all day. The Lord said that was not a guided missile. He said he was, he was excellent at the sling. Because he told me, he said, look in the scripture. It says that he trained 30 men to hit within a hair's breadth with a sling and a stone. So he, he taught them how to be accurate. It wasn't just a gift. It was a gift, but it was developed through practice. And I was shown that David was always practicing, he was always playing his harp, and that he, be, he was being groomed for the leadership that he was appointed to do. When he received the anointing, of course, then um, that's a whole nother thing. But these are things that need to be taught. So we're in Christ, it's already established. And within that, we have all these perfect things. There's, there's, people, there's people in here, you have so much, so much written about you, and very little is known. And the Lord is saying this, and I want to leave and go to my room right now, but I'm not going to, I'm going to give it a couple minutes because I want you to come to a conclusion that it's not just going to fall on you. It's going to fall on you, but then you're going to have to work it. Some of the most valuable things that I've ever been given, one of them is from my grandma. I would watch her when I go down there, and I was just sick because I like talking to her because she prayed for me all the time. And um, she would cook for me because we didn't have a lot of food growing up. And she would always be doing um, uh, quilt, quilting. So she would take all these pieces of material, and she would cut them, and then she would make different really nice designs and make these big bedspreads. And um, one day after she'd passed, my dad gave me a package, and it was that quilt. She was making that for me the whole time and never told me. But that took years. I mean, she was always working on it. And so that quilt, I mean, I didn't even want to use it, but I just took that and hugged it, and I thought, man, the labor that went into that. I thought, you know, that's, 
I remember because uh, she said, uh, you know, I know your dad doesn't make much because that's her, her son, you know, and he goes, are you okay? And I said, well, sometimes we don't have a lot of food, but she said, well, just come down here. Don't say anything. Just come down. Just go out in the yard and, and run the whole way down to my, to my yard, you know, and um, this is what she did. She was retired. My grandfather was retired, but I told her, well, you know, we don't have a lot of food. Sometimes when I open my lunchbox when I get to school, it's not very much, you know, but, you know, I don't know what to do. And, you know, and I was just, I wasn't even old enough to work yet. I, I started working at 14 because I had to. But all of a sudden I, at, at, at school, I went to the lunchroom and all the other kids were rich. And so they, they could buy a hot meal, you know, they would pay, they would pay and have a ticket. There was a red ticket and then there was a blue ticket. The red ticket was for a hot meal and then the blue ticket was for a milk. And the milk was five cents and the, the, the meal was 35 cents. And I never would be able to do that, you know. And so I'd open my lunchbox and, you know, I got what I got. Well, one day when I went there, she was working there. She was behind. She doesn't have to work. She goes, hey, you want a hot meal? She would get, she wouldn't take it because could, she could have just dished it out to me. She didn't steal it. She got in her purse, got 35 cents out, and gave it to the manager and bought me my meal. And she, would, she got the job so that I would have a hot meal. And she would, she would just hug me and cry and say, I love you. And she knew my dad was beating me. And she would go up there and yell at him. They'd have fights, and I would just hide. And then I would feel guilty because it was my fault somehow, you know. But she was the only one who would protect me. And I thought, you know, this woman didn't pray in tongues. I don't know if she went to church or not, but she loved people. She loved, they would do anything for me. And that's how I want all of us to be toward each other. And that's how Jesus was with me. He said, Kevin, I'm not just going to tell you what to do. I'm going to tell you how to do it. I'm going to be there with you every step of the way. And that's what I want for everybody. I want for my students. I want for my staff. I want for everybody. I want everybody to feel comfortable and walking with God and knowing that we have each other and that we can make it through this that we've been counted as trustworthy to live at this time. And I love South Africa. I love all of you. I, I love you all. And I, I, w I, wish, I, I wish for this type of hunger all over. Most of everywhere I go, the hunger with the people at Warrior Notes is, is this strong. But I have shared things that I've never shared before with you already. Amen. God bless you. Let me pray. Father, thank you. Thank you so much, Lord. May your hand be upon us with compassion like my grandmother, Lord, that, that we would just have a, a compassion to pray for each other and to help each other. So Lord, there's so many people in here, they just need, they just need money for gas. They need money for, to pay their bills. I pray, Lord, that through um, the Spirit that everyone would have their needs met in a supernatural way through, through all of us, the body ministering to each other. Thank you, Lord, for compassion, and, and I thank you for everyone that will be touched and this will be permanent. In the name of Jesus. Hey, Kathy, did you feel like you wanted to share that? Is it still on you? I, I didn't look at her. She had a word the last service, and I, I didn't look at her. And so do you, do you feel like you could share it now? Okay. She had a word for the last service, and I, I didn't look down at her. I felt bad. Well, it was just that spirit of prophecy that was in here this morning where the Lord was exhorting us to, um, it was sort of like a wake-up call, like the Lord wants us to be ready for what's coming ahead. And so with that um, anointing that was has been in here today, that the Lord's reaching out to us, he's encouraging us that we, you hear us talk about and like, you know, so Jesus moved with compassion. So with a spirit of compassion, he would exhort us all to 
to be sober minded and to pray in the spirit it's 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 such a beautiful gift the lord gave us to be able to be baptized with the holy spirit and fire but it's not just to feel good it's also for our survival because we don't know how we ought to pray but the holy spirit knows how to pray and when we're praying in other tongues we're speaking out mysteries we're talking to god and there's things that you can't you don't know what to pray in english it what the lord has for you is but beyond you so it's, he's not only wanting to get things to you that you couldn't even think, ask, or imagine, but he's also wanting things to flow through you in that same way. So we came a long ways by the power of God to be here with you. And I know a lot of you came a long way to be here with us. So we don't want one person to leave here not filled with the power of the Holy Spirit and fire and praying in other tongues, because you must pray in other tongues. Jesus commanded us that after he went to be with the Father, he prayed that the Father would send the Spirit, and the Spirit was poured out on us. So if you are in here and you have never been baptized with the Holy Spirit and fire, or you have, but you've never been released in your prayer language and pray in other tongues, could you raise your hand? If there's somebody in here, or you might be somebody who's, like they said in the Bible, we haven't even heard that there was a Holy Spirit. They were born again and saved, but they'd never heard about being filled with the Holy Spirit. If that's you, could you just stand in your chair? If you've never been filled with the Holy Spirit, never prayed in tongues, or never even heard about being filled with the Holy Spirit, because that's for all of us. Jesus prayed a great, paid a great price for us to be filled. So you that are standing, could you... Um, can I just ask, could you just come down and Pastor Mike and the, and Brittany and Jason and I, we're going to pray for you, okay? Anybody who's not been filled with the Holy Spirit and pray in other tongues, and those of you that have, please stay and don't go because we're going to pray corporately together, okay? If you do pray in other tongues, just stay here because the Lord wants us all to pray some things out before we leave. Okay, so everybody here has not been released in their prayer line. Are you all, have you been born again? Okay, all right, so we're just going to pray together a prayer. Let everybody get down here. These are just people that have never prayed in tongues. You've never been filled with the Spirit or prayed in other tongues. Only, this is just, the Lord had it on my heart that we cannot leave. We came a long ways. And if we could, we don't want to leave you because we love you. We don't want to leave you without you receiving the baptism of the Holy Spirit. We would be so sad if we left. And there was someone who had not received that gift that Jesus paid a great price for. Okay? So let's just pray. Just pray after me. Say, Father... Thank you for sending the Holy Spirit. Jesus, thank you for making a way. I ask you to fill me now with the Holy Spirit and with fire. And I, I release my tongue and I pray in other tongues now. Now just begin to pray, but don't pray in your native. To pray in, don't pray in the language you know, but just let out the sounds that are in your spirit. Keep going. Just like a baby, they might not know what they're saying, but they want to say mama and dada. They make a noise. They get that breath flowing out. Napokoropushte. Istaborrababaste, and our our staff is gonna. If you need, if you need, are, they're just gonna come around and just lay a hand on you and make sure. Shokorrobushabare keria to korrababase, orrababaso korrebete. Janet Ann, you wanna help me? Domokorramamase. Thank you all for staying. You guys out there, you all know how important it is to be filled with the Spirit. Shomorramamasakote. More shaborrobuvuste, 
Horrobobuste. Those of you that are already filled, put your hand on your belly. Say, more, Lord. More, Lord. Fresh fire. More, Lord. More, Lord. Balamandorra bababa socorra base. Socorra baba sekiria to corrobobuso. Horra mama sekiria mondo. She poteke sekete. Just let the river flow. Let the river flow. Let the river flow. Let the river flow. Shambhala mondo. You're praying out mysteries. You're praying out. The Lord needs to hear your voice. Your voice, your voice, your voice. You're praying into your family. You're praying into your nation. You're praying into the politics. You're praying into the future. You're apprehending through the spirit. We apprehend what Jesus apprehended for us. Lamborra, Masande, Kosondo, Rabashe, Botoko, Ramamasho, Morramamase, Morramamase, Morramamaso. Orra babase, borra fashe, hallelujah. <laughs> More, mashekita kate, borra mamaso, kurra mamase. Orra baba, let the river flow. The river must flow. Rivers in the desert, rivers in the desert, rivers in the desert. Shokorra base, borra mamaso. Oh, thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Shamore. Shamore. Hallelujah. Keep going. Javushane kete koso. Orra babaso. Orra babaso. Zomo tomoso. Zomo tomoso. Can you pray for me? Thank you, Jesus. Shamburu buru buru vara 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 thank you Jesus buru 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 vara 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 raise your hand. everyone raise your hands she's just going to lead us a little bit in tongues buru 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 vara 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 shamburu buru buru vara 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 thank you Jesus thank you for the river lord thank you for the river all of your children can pray in tongues. Shokura masateke. Thank you, Lord. Lord, we just thank you. Thank everybody. Okay, everybody got their gift. Thank you all for, for staying. Let's just um, all stand before we go. And um, let's all just pray together in the spirit with our um, brothers and sisters who just received. Okay. Shamorra mama sokuro. Everybody good down there, Jason? Jupo Kodo, they called Jason's. Everybody good down on his end. Jomotomo, everybody good down at your end? Okay. All right, we're all going to just pray in the spirit. Shamorra, we're going to seal it in, Lord. We thank you, Lord. We give you permission to pray out everything you need to pray out of us, Lord. Strength to bring forth. And we just um, cover this time in the blood of Jesus. We thank you for fruit that remains, that the river will flow. The river must flow more and more and more. And that you bring us all back safely together tonight. And we just de declare completion over these meetings. Total victory and completion. In Jesus' name, hallelujah. God bless you all. You're welcome to stay and pray or go your way. But we'll see you back in a little bit, okay?